This is the story of Transair Flight 810. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, then you'll probably know about Transair Flight 810. It's the 737-200 that went down off the coast of Hawaii. Now, in 2023, we finally know what happened on that fateful night. Let me walk you through what happened. On the 2nd of July, 2021, an old Boeing 737-200 was to fly from Honolulu to Kahului Airport. Once the crew got on the plane, they got down to the nitty-gritty details for the flight. They talked about the weather, the performance limitations of the airplane, and then they talked to the cargo load manager about how the plane was loaded up. The pilots got the balance sheets for the airplane, and the pilots got what they needed to set out. But before they could do that, the first officer needed to do a walk around of the plane. That's when the first officer found some dried up hydraulic fluid on the right main landing gear. This was weird and cause for concern, so they brought out a mechanic. They checked the hydraulic fluid reservoir and it was full, so they decided that the dried fluid was not a concern and that the flight could go on as planned. The pilots started both engines and seeing that both engines were in the green, they started the flight. With the instruments checking out, the pilots took the plane to runway 8 right. Once on the runway, the first officer brought the engines up to an EPR value of 1.4 and then asked the captain to set the takeoff thrust. He did that by pushing the engines all the way up to an EPR value of 2.01, which was the takeoff thrust for this takeoff. Then the tower cleared them for takeoff. The first officer was the one flying, and he acknowledged. As the plane barreled down the runway, the captain noticed that the temperature of the gases exiting the engine were right on the border between the green zone and the yellow zone, meaning that they were in the green, but by the smallest of margins. To the captain, this looked good, and he said that the engines were stable. The first officer pushed on with a takeoff. Soon they went past their V1 speed and then the V2 speed, and before long, the ancient 737 picked up enough speed and took off into the dark skies of Hawaii for the short hop. They stayed on the runway heading of 080 degrees for a bit. Then, just seconds after takeoff, a thud was heard. Both pilots knew exactly what had happened. They had lost an engine. The right-hand engine seemed to be the one in trouble. This was bad as they were only 390 feet off the water and they needed to gain altitude fast. As they watched, the power generated by the right-hand engine dropped. The EPR for the right-hand engine went from 2.01 to about 1.43. This obviously caused a lot of concern for the pilots. The pilots fought to level the plane as one of their engines gave out, and they did a good job of that, but there was the matter of getting this plane back on the runway. As the captain retracted the flaps, he noticed that the power on the left-hand engine reduced just a bit. Their biggest aim right now was to get the 737 to a safe altitude. They were at 1,200 feet, and they needed to get to 2,000 feet and maintain that. Somehow they coaxed the wounded jet up to an altitude of 2,107 feet. But then the unthinkable happened. The power on engine number one, the left hand engine, started to fail. Power fell from 1.91 to 1.83 to 1.53 and 1.23 over the span of 1 minute and 17 seconds. While all of this was unfolding, the pilots and the controller were having a bit of confusion. The captain said, We've lost an engine. We are 220 heading, maintaining 2,000, declaring emergency. After this transmission, the CVR recorded the controller saying, Say again, heading 240. But this second transmission was for another plane in the vicinity. But the controller immediately cleared flight 810 for a straighten approach to runway 4 right. But the pilots were not ready for that. They told the controller that they needed some more time to run a few checklists. That made all the sense in the world. This was a fully loaded 737 loaded to the ground on one engine. Making a one engine approach to the airport without the proper procedures that would have been a recipe for disaster. With the way things were, the pilots would let the controller know that they were ready to bring the plane back into the airport. As this exchange was happening, the captain noticed that the power produced by the left-hand engine dropped even more, this time to an EPR of 1.05, which was very much near flight idle. In simple terms, for some reason, the left-hand engine, the engine that was working, was now producing very little thrust. Being over the dark ocean with no engines heading away from the nearest airport at very low altitude is not a place you really want to be. The captain knew that he now had to take control of the plane. The pilots troubleshot the situation, and they coaxed some thrust out of the engine. Then, the first officer asked the million dollar question, should we head back towards the airport before we get too far away? The captain intended to keep the plane at 2,000 feet and about 15 miles away from the airport because he wanted to keep the 737 away from traffic, and also because he needed some time to troubleshoot the situation. 
The captain then called for the engine failure checklist as he made a turn towards the right to keep the airplane close to the airport, but he wasn't ready to land yet. The first officer then noticed that the engine that they had coaxed a bit of thrust out of to keep the plane airborne was now redlining. They needed to pull back power on it just a bit. The pilots then decided to make a beeline for the airport. As the jet flew, the first officer set the plane up for an instrument approach to runway 4 right. The captain made the necessary calls to the controller. He then added, we might lose the other engine too. For flight 810, it was getting desperate. Then, the right-hand engine started failing. The power was dropping, the plane was at 1,000 feet, and the captain said, we can't keep dropping. But they were dropping, and fast. It wasn't clear if the pilots would be able to make it to the runway with the altitude and the speed that they had but they were going to try their best. As the plane lost altitude, the first officer said, we're descending, we have to climb. They further configured the aircraft and that put them into a slight climb. But the exhaust temperature from the engine was well beyond the max temperature range. As the captain held the altitude as best as he could, the first officer tried his best to go through the checklist. As they wrestled with the plane, the ground proximity warning system said, 500 too low gear. They were getting awfully close to the water and they had no way out at this point. The captain radioed to the controller. We've lost the number one engine. We're coming straight to the airport. We're going to need the fire department. There's a chance we're going to lose the other engine too. It's very hot. He then added, we're pretty low on speed. It doesn't look good out here. You might want to let the Coast Guard know as well. They were now preparing for a ditching. In the cockpit, alarms were blaring, letting the pilots know that they were too low. They were now just 300 feet off the water and the first officer was asking the captain to pull back till the stick shaker came on, thus eking out every little bit of range that they could get with the altitude that they had. They now needed to get to the airport. The controller had cleared them to land on any runway at the airport, but they still didn't have the runway in sight. The controller then had an idea. Kalailoa Rogers Airport was just three miles away and they might be able to make it there. The controller then put them on a heading of 310, which would take them right towards Kalailoa Rogers Airport. But Flight 810 had run out of time and altitude. The captain said, we're in the water, and then the plane impacted the water. Thankfully, since the Coast Guard had been alerted in advance of the plane going in, they were able to rescue the two pilots. The captain had some serious injuries, but he made it thankfully. The first officer survived with some minor injuries. The 737 that went down was an old one. It was the Dash 200. It had been flying for decades. But jets are maintained so well that they're still reliable even after decades on the job. So how did this plane lose both of its engines? Well, due to radio calls, the investigators knew that there was an engine failure before the wreck was even brought up. Once they had the engines in the shop, they were able to look at the engines. Then they saw the issue clear as day. The right-hand engine had two broken Stage 1 compressor blades. You see, the blades had weight reduction holes drilled into them. Those holes started to corrode. From there, it was just a matter of time before the two blades failed. Once the blades failed, they caused massive downstream damage in the engine, basically destroying it. No wonder this engine was reading exhaust temperatures that were well above what they expected to see. But here's what's interesting. The turbine blades on the right-hand engine showed rotational damage, meaning that it was spinning at a high rate of speed when it hit the water. But the left-hand engine did not, which meant that the left-hand engine was not running, but the right-hand engine was. How did that happen? What happened to the left-hand engine? Well, when they tore it down, they found out that it was in fine working order. Nothing had gone wrong with the left-hand engine. The pilots of Flight 810 had shut the wrong engine down. The malfunctioning engine had been kept on, and the working engine had been shut off. How could two experienced pilots have made such a mistake? Well, listening to the CVR, they got their answer. When the initial failure happened, the airplane was stabilized and then both engines were brought back to idle as per the rules. The captain was unaware that the first officer had done this. This is why the left-hand engine EPR values dropped down drastically when the captain was watching on because the first officer had pulled back power on both engines. In the captain's head, it would have been easy to maintain 220 knots and 2,000 feet with one working engine, but he couldn't do that because both engines were at idle. What's even more interesting is that at first, both pilots recognized that the right-hand engine had failed. Then, after a few minutes of troubleshooting, 
came this very critical exchange. The captain asked, let's see what the problem is. Which one? What's going on with the gauges? Who has the EGT or the exhaust gas temperature? The first officer then stated that the left engine was gone and said, so we have two or the right engine. This is the precise moment where the misidentification happened. This conversation came a few minutes after the start of the crisis. The first officer who was the pilot flying had a lot on his plate. Even though he had said that the right engine had lost power earlier on in the emergency, he now mistakenly said that the left-hand engine was the one in trouble. In addition to that, both engines were now at idle. Remember, that is what the checklist called for, and the left-hand engine was at a slightly lower power setting than the right-hand one. This might have given him the wrong idea that the left-hand engine was the engine that had failed. So, when the captain was told about the failure of the left-hand engine, he said number one is gone? He was expecting the opposite to be the case, but since the first officer was the one in control of the plane, the captain was like, he knows what's best. But the captain's initial assessment was right. They would have been able to diagnose the situation if they had just applied some power to the left-hand engine, but they didn't. However, this diagnostic test was not in any of the checklists that the pilots had to do. Furthermore, the checklist assumed that the plane would be undergoing an asymmetric thrust situation, but it did not take into consideration that the pilots might have stabilized the plane. Here's what the report had to say. Because there was no longer a clear sign of which engine had failed, the crew had forgotten its earlier determination that the right-hand engine had lost power. Critical thinking was required for the crew to devise diagnostic steps to confirm the affected engine. However, each pilot's thinking was degraded by the high workload and stress. From that point on, the situation got more dire and the stress piled up and no one realized that they had shut the wrong engine down." End quote. This incident is very much reminiscent of the Kegward disaster. In that case, the pilots made the same mistake, but for very different reasons. But they never caught their mistake and believed that they had lost both engines. In both cases, both crews were not able to figure out that they had shut the wrong engine down. If you'd like to know what happened in that instance, then please watch my video on the Kegward disaster. Link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.